Okay, so we're getting close to the start time. So I uh, just wanted to welcome everybody. You're, if you're not planning to see a talk, if you are, sorry to say, if you're planning to see a talk on the amazing Manzanita and all her relations by Kate Marion Child, you are in the right place. If that's not what you were expecting, uh, you're not in the right place, but I sort of urge you to stay because this is gonna be a great talk. <laughs> uh, I'm Vivian New. I'm the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I wanted to welcome you tonight to our talk on Manzanitas. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about us before we get started on the talk though. If you're not familiar with the California Native Plant Society, we're a nonprofit environmental organization and we were founded in 1965. We have over 10,000 members across 35 chapters, um, which cover California and Baja California as well. Now we're the Santa Clara Valley chapter and we cover all of Santa Clara County as well as Southern San Mateo County. If you go north of Southern San Mateo, um, you move into the Yerba Buena chapters area. Now our mission is to save California's native plants and their habitats. And we do that with science, education, conservation, and gardening. So we have talks covering all of these areas and I hope you enjoyed tonight's talk, but we also have other talks that I think you'll enjoy as well. And, I'm, um, and so if you're not currently a member of CNPS, um, you certainly don't have to be to see our talks. We, we welcome everybody, but we would love to have your support. And if you become a member, um, you'll receive two, these two wonderful journals, Flora and Fremontia, which uh, tell you a lot about California native plants as well as a lot of other fun um, information around them. You'll also, if you associate yourself with our chapter, receive our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, which tells you about all these wonderful events that we have, as well as a lot of other interesting information. And you also get discounts at local nurseries and a lot more. So if you're not currently a, a member, we would love to have you join us. And to do that, just go to cnps.org slash join. Now we have, a, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of events scheduled. Um, next week, we're having our annual members night photo sharing meeting, and that will be uh, next Wednesday, but it starts at seven rather than 7.30 as we're doing tonight. Hope you'll be able to join us. That's a really fun event where members share pictures of various plant adventures they've had over the past year. Um, following that, we're gonna have a, a panel discussion on maintaining your native plant garden. Winter is a very busy time for native plant gardeners. And we were gonna have a panel um, to talk about that. We have a bunch of landscapers, uh, home gardeners. So they'll talk about their tips and you can bring your questions and they'll help you if you have any things that you've been wondering about. Um, following that, at the beginning of February, we will have a talk on gardening for biodiversity with native plants by Shel Tao. And uh, if you're interested in gardening and or thinking about add, native, adding native plants to your garden, this will be a great talk um, for you. Following that in February, we will have a history of the, a natural history of San Bruno Mountain. And San Bruno Mountain is in the middle of the peninsula. It's a really great place to visit. It has a lot of unique um, plants. And David Nelson and Doug Alshouse will be talking about it then. And we always have more uh, in the pipeline. So you can see what we've done already by going to our YouTube channel. All of our talks are recorded and you can even watch tonight's talk uh, as soon as immediately, it's, as soon as it's over. Um, but you can also see the other talks that we've done over the past year and uh, our future talks as well. Uh, we also have a nursery. And if you're interested in buying native plants, because this is the time to plant, you can order online and then pick, either pick your plants up at the nursery. But if you live between Belmont and San Jose, you can also have them delivered to your house. All the pre proceeds from the nursery go to fund the work of the chapter. Uh, all, our, all the people who support the nursery are volunteers. So it's, uh, it's really the main way that our chapter makes money to support events like this and all the other work that we do. Um, and you can, there's a, a long 
link here with the, the site name, but you can also just go to cnps-scv.org and the link is right there on the site. Now, if you want to find out about our events as we schedule them, or just be reminded of what's going on in the current week, I urge you to join our chapter news list. It's a once a week message and it just tells you about our upcoming events and anything new that's scheduled. So that's a, a really easy one. And you can also find, um, it's a Google group. So there's an email message or email address here to subscribe, or you can just go to our website and there's information on the website on how to subscribe. And if you're enjoying this event and you've been, you, inter you, you like Zoom and you're interested in helping us, we could always use more help. So if you're interested in being one of our moderators, um, or one of our co-hosts, all you really need to be able to do is be comfortable with a keyboard, a mouse, switching windows, cutting and pasting, and we would love to have you join us. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in doing, there's a couple contacts here, Johanna Kwan uh, or Madeline Morrow. You can find them both on our website as well. And now I'm taking us to the feature presentation. We have Kate Marion Child here today, and I am so thrilled about that. Uh, um, one of the things I do is uh, I'm a docent with the Midpen uh, Open Space District, and I really found her book, The Secrets of the Oak Woodland, absolutely inspirational. I think every docent should read it. Actually, anyone who goes out hiking should read it. It just gives you a wonderful look uh, at, and, and ideas about what you see out there. She is really an amazing author and naturalist. Um, she, uh, so again, I, I just love the book and I highly recommend getting it and reading it if you don't, haven't already done so. Um, she actually lives in a yurt up by Ukiah, surrounded by acorn woodpeckers, wood rats, newts, and five kinds of oaks. Um, when she's not giving talks, guiding walks, or observing nature, she swims, sings, and advocates for the preservation of native plants and the food webs that depend on them. She is an absolutely amazing person. And so, I am going to turn it over to her right now. Oh, wait, actually, sorry, one more thing. Um, we are gonna mute everybody. And um, if you have any questions, Kate will be happy to take them at the end of the talk. So please just go ahead and type them into the chat. And we have a moderator who will be reading them to her at the end of the talk, but do feel free to type them in the chat at any point in time. And we are also recording this on YouTube, as I mentioned before. So, okay, now I truly am done and I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. So Kate, please go ahead. This is visible. Okay, <laughs> great. Hi everybody. Uh, now I'm going to, okay. So um, before I put my PowerPoint title slide up, I just wanna say a few things. Uh, how many people are here now, by the way? We have over 300 on Zoom. We have 311 on Zoom and there's more on YouTube. I don't have okay. that number. Well, on YouTube. I just keep thinking who would have thunk that I would be speaking to almost 300 people from my little yurt here in the hills of Mendocino County. I wouldn't have ever thunk that. So I just want to say, if you have to leave early, um, you, let's see, you know it's being recorded on the website or it's, it'll be up on CNPS's website. And two weeks from today, I'm going to be giving a talk called Who's Who Among the Oaks uh, about oak identification. It's a really fun talk. And that will be at the same time, 7.30 for the East Bay CNPS chapter. And you can go to my website at, which is my name, katemarionchild.com to uh, register for it or, or to get the link to register for it or, and to read about it. And then also, uh, if you have to leave early, just know that you can go to my website for educational information about native plants and insects, caterpillars and et cetera. You can uh, buy my book there, buy my oak identification guides and my uh, the close focusing binoculars that I share and if that I sell. And if you would like to be notified about my future talks, 
Oh, and, and also sometimes receive photo essays that I send out. Please uh, either go to my website and send me an email through the website or my website, my email address is going to be on the chat and just put uh, email list in the subject line. And then I will know to add you to my email list. And before I start, I wanna thank the photographers whose uh, slides I've used. I have a lot of my own, but I also have a lot of other people's. And I haven't kept track over the years of, how, of every photographer for you know, knowing which photographer took which photograph. So they're not all credited. And if you would like me, if you see your phot photograph in this slideshow and you would like me to be able to credit you in the future, just send me an email about that. Okay, so now I'm going to have to fiddle around here for a minute. PowerPoint. Okay, is that um, looking good to you? That's great. Okay. Now I have a problem still that the uh, photographs on the right are hiding. Oh, let's see, I think I can. Okay, good. I just got rid of everybody but me. <laughs> okay. So as you can see, the name of this talk is The Amazing Manzanita and All Her Relations. And I want to say a couple things about the title. I want to thank the native people of this continent for the phrase, all my relations or all are related and the concept that all beings are our relatives and that every being, plant and animal is as important as humans are in the web of life. I believe this truth and I believe it's the most important guiding principle we can live by. I also want to thank the native Californians for having modeled a largely peaceful and entirely sustainable way of living on and caring for California's landscapes. So manzanita means little apple in Spanish. It's a feminine noun. And so that's why I say all her relations. It's not because manzanita is a female plant. The flowers are bisexual. Manzanita is a descendant of madrone. Uh oh, let's see. Uh oh, now my slides aren't advancing. There. Uh, which is also known as madronia, madronio, bearberry, and arbutus. In British Columbia, they call it arbutus instead of any of those other names. And that's actually where this particular amazing tree is from. Manzanitas are in the Arctostaphylus genus, which first appeared in central California either 15 million years ago or 37 million years ago. I thought it was 37 million years, but I was talking to Doug Allhouse yesterday and he thought it was 15 million. So I didn't have time to dig into it and find my source for that. But in any case, it was a really, really long time ago. And about one and a half million years ago, the genus started diversifying and dispersing. And now there are 107 naturally occurring species and subspecies worldwide, and a whopping 97 species and subspecies in California, which is the ground zero world center of Manzanita diversity. And I believe that among California plants, Manzanita demonstrates an unparalleled degree of speciation and diversity, which means that it has an extraordinary ability to adapt to different habitats. Manzanitas range in size and shape from two inch high mats to tall stately trees, some as high as 40 feet tall and others like this big berry manzanita with enormous trunks, or this is multiple trunks. There are manzanitas that are 200 years old that are non burl forming. And I just read that there are burl forming manzanitas that are a thousand years old. 
My images tonight are oriented to the larger and more tree-like manzanitas because those are the ones I'm most familiar with and the most drawn to. But much of the information applies to the Arctostaphylus genus as a whole. So before I dive in, I want to take a moment to just revel with you in the beauty of the tree forming manzanitas. Their amazing colors, the smoothness of their bark, which can resemble human skin, and the shapes of the branches and trunks that are sometimes so much like muscled limbs and their sinuous, twisty, curvy shapes. This tree also demonstrates the beautiful and botanic, botanically rare phenomenon of dead wood intermixing with living wood. The dead wood is often in parallel streams or stripes and is most beautifully and abundantly evident in old growth trees. Check these out. And even the phenomenon of bark peeling, which I'll talk more about later, has its own beauty. So with its ability to adapt, Manzanita must have some remarkable survival strategies. And I'm going to start in on those from the ground up. This plant tends to grow in dry, nutrient-poor soil, and its most important survival strategy is probably its heavy reliance on mycorrhizal fungi, such as this Manzanita bolete, which is a partner of, of Manzanitas and Madrones. And you can see by these Madrone leaves here that this one is under a Madrone. 95% of all plants on earth rely on fungal partners, but manzanita seems to depend on them more heavily than most. So a plant's fungal partners collect water and nutrients from soil and from wealthier members of the ecosystem and deliver them via the roots. These wealthier plants are shrubs and trees with large canopies that make a lot of sugar, large root systems, large fungal networks that collect a lot of water and nutrients. There's a chapter in my book called Miraculous Mycorrhizas about this amazing phenomenon, which is the most widespread, thought to be the most widespread symbiosis on earth. But briefly, these mushrooms, these are also manzanita, manzanita beliefs, which are the above ground fruiting bodies of a large underground network of one cell thick threads called hyphae. The hyphae connect with the roots of plants, which is where the word mycorrhiza comes from. Myco means uh, fungus and rhiza means root. The fungi provide plants with up to 100 times more nutrients than their roots, their roots alone can provide them. And they also stimulate the immune systems of their plant partners and provide an underground communication system that tells their plant partners about pending threats. They're also a place where the plant can store extra sugars. So Manzanita partners with at least 18 truffles and mushrooms, and it's probably more now since I wrote my book, including these black chanterelles, also known as black trumpets and horns of plenty. So while fungi are probably Manzanita's most important survival strategy overall, and especially its most important survival strategy for drought, it has a couple of other backup plans for drought. Have you ever noticed that Manzanita leaves never look wilted? That's partly because they are sclerophyllous, and that, no, that's not an STD. That means they're relatively hard and leathery and coated with a thin veneer of wax, all characteristics that reduce water loss. But they also have another trick up their sleeves for which I need to give you a little background. The leaves of all trees and shrubs have tiny pores called stomata through which carbon dioxide enters a leaf and water and oxygen leave the leaf. 
when the stomata are on the underside of the leaf as they are in most trees and shrubs, and these are way magnified and uh, there are a whole lot of stomata, not just three. Um, on the underside of the leaf, they're somewhat protected from heat and air currents. So the plant loses less water through them. But in most manzanitas, the pores are on both the underside and the upper surface of the leaf, which makes the plant more vulnerable to water loss. But manzanita has evolved a great trick to compensate for that. Its leaves follow the sun all day long. They track the sun, constantly changing their positions in order to keep their edges instead of their flat surface turned toward the sun. That reduce heat, reduces heat on the flat surfaces and thus reduces water loss. So to help you remember this, I have put new words to the chorus of the Beatles song, I'll Follow the Sun. And I hope you will all sing it with me. So I have to get my, my pitch here. Uh, and if you are shy about singing, well, if you're alone in your house, nobody's going to hear you. And maybe you're alone in a room. So please, uh, please be brave. Lose much water and I'll be bummed. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to start over and take a drink. <clears throat> Lose much water and I'll be bummed. So I tell every leaf edge, just follow the sun. Oh. Lose much water and I'll be done. So I tell every leaf edge, just follow the sun. Okay, so I'm going to do it again and I hope you'll do it with me. Maybe you can drown me out a little bit so I won't sound so hoarse. Lose much water and I'll be bummed. So I tell every leaf edge, just follow the sun. Lose much water and I'll be done. So I tell every leaf edge, just follow the sun. Okay, thank you. It was great to have you singing with me, even if I couldn't hear you. So here is a third drought adaptation of Manzanita. Have you ever noticed and wondered about these structures? These are a very rare phenomenon called nascent inflorescences. Huh. Well, my uh, animation isn't working. Let's see. Uh-oh, hold on, there. Uh, nascent inflorescences, they contain complete embryonic flowers that form much mu many months before they bloom. And then they wait and wait in a state of dormancy, first through heat and then through freezing temperatures until sufficient rain falls, at which point they burst into bloom. Nascent inflorescences, uh, sorry, it's not advancing. Give Manzanita the advantage of being able to so-called bloom on a dime after a long drought. Only a handful of plants in the world form nascent inflorescences and form nascent inflorescences. I thought it was just one other, but I just read recently that on the Santa Rosa Plateau, they're talking about it in Ceanothus and some other plants. So another probable adaptation to drought in Manzanita is the phenomenon that some call bark striping, which is the presence of so much dead wood paralleling or intermixed with living wood. It hasn't been studied as far as I know, uh, but one hypothesis is that the plant sacrifices part of itself during drought so that the rest can survive. Bristletone cone pines also do this and they also grow in extremely dry conditions. 
And now I'm going to talk about Manzanita's amazing bark, which is wafer thin, silky smooth, and comes in colors that range from red to orange to yellow and even almost black, and it peels. So first, why is it so thin? Most shrubs and trees have thick bark, right? And for good reasons. Now I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to think, see if you can think of any of those reasons that, um, manzan that thick bark is advantageous for a plant. Okay, so thick bark protects plants from insects, disease, fire, extreme cold, and probably a few other things like water loss. So why does manzanita have thin bark? There must be some survival benefit to it. Does this image give you a clue? Why is there green under the red bark? Because the green tissues contain chloroplasts, which are the organs of photosynthesis. And the reason the bark is so thin is so sunlight can actually shine through to the chloroplasts when the bark isn't peeling. So I know what you're thinking. Manzanita makes sugar not only in its leaves, but also in its trunk and branches. And you're right. The term for this is stem photosynthesis. So that may be the big trade-off. The ability to make more sugar is worth the risks that come along with thin skin. But what's the peeling all about then? Well, that allows more light to reach the chloroplasts, resulting in more sugar production. And it's probably not an accident that manzanita peels around summer solstice, the longest day of the year when the most sunlight is available. That extra light enables a growth spurt, which scientists think is particularly helpful for young plants growing in the shade of larger shrubs or trees. So here is a little poem about bark peeling that I'd love for you to recite with me. This is for, you know, it's for a memory aid, but it's also for boredom and overload prevention. So uh, it goes, Manzanita, your waver thin bark peels in summer neath the solstice sun's spark, but hiding neath red is a meadow of green, your trunks making sugar. That's what that means. So this thin skin is great for letting light in. And of course the skin couldn't peel very well if it weren't thin. But what about the fact that thin skin makes a plant vulnerable to disease? So let's look at these images. Here we have lichens and here's some moss and Here's a lichen, here's a little moss, here's a fungus, here's another fungus. So did you notice anything in particular about, I'm gonna go back through these photos and see if you see anything that they have in common. Each one, each of those organisms was attached to or living on only dead wood, not living wood. So why don't they live on living wood? Well, one, because it's so smooth that it's hard for them to get purchase on it. And two, the skin peels every year and sloughs off epiphytes and fungi that might have taken hold. And why would that be a good thing? How would that benefit Manzanita, because those organisms could harbor things that could invade or in some way harm the plant. So peeling appears to have two functions, promoting stem photosynthesis and removing living things from the bark. So if you see something growing on the living wood like this, this is a lousy picture, um, 
Try probing underneath it and look more closely. I think you will always find a tiny spot of dead wood underneath and maybe, or possibly a bit of soil that's built up in a depression where bark fails to peel. And you're welcome to call me in the middle of the night to let me know if you have proved me wrong. And there's one more important question. Why is manzanita wood so incredibly red? Well, that's because it's extremely high in tannins. Same with redwood bark. Tannins are chemical compounds that make the skin not only red, but also bitter, and they discourage anybody from eating it. So that's another adaptation that compensates for the risks involved in having thin skin. Also, interestingly, tannins and smooth skin slow the process of ignition during a fire. But most of the manzanitas I know that have been through fire in the last few years have gotten fried. So it's certainly not enough protection during high intensity fires. When nat native Californians manage this fire prone landscape by burning every year or two or three, one of the plants they were protecting and nurturing by reducing fuel loads was manzanita. And so that brings me to the all her relations section of this talk. Humans are very much one of manzanita's relations. Manzanita plants were so important to many native Californians that individual families sometimes own great swaths of them. They tended their plants with care and they held a big feast and dance every year to celebrate the ripening of the berries. They made food and drink from the berries and medicine mainly from the leaves, but a little bit from the berries. And there are more details about that in my book. And what about Manzanita's other relations besides humans? As I wander and wonder or wander and ponder, as my friend Sally said recently, my wonderings about plants often start with three questions. How is this plant pollinated? What insects feed on it? And how are its seeds dispersed? If you try to answer these questions about almost any plant, you'll find yourself deeply, deeply and hopefully delightfully drawn into the web of life. So I'm gonna start with insects because insect populations are declining drastically and insects are the foundation of animal food webs. Many of you I know in the Santa Clara Valley CNPS recently heard Doug Tallamy's talk on that subject. But if you didn't, I urge you to go to uh, Santa Clara's uh, CNPS website, CNPS Santa Clara Valley's website, it's a mouthful, to watch the video of it, or go to one of many of the videos that you can find by Doug Tallamy on YouTube. One I re recommend is The Living Landscape, but they're, they're all excellent. So how is manzanita pollinated? Well, it blooms, oh, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Uh, when does it bloom? And actually uh, we timed this uh, talk with the blooming of manzanita. We thought uh, it hasn't bloomed here yet, but it blooms in deep winter right around now. And what are the challenges that face plants that bloom in winter? Rain is one and the other is a lack of pollinators. So let's start with rain. The rain that we all want and love and need so much can also be a problem sometimes because it can wash pollen away. So any plant that blooms in winter has to have a strategy for not having its pollen washed away. And this is Manzanita's strategy. Its flowers hang down and the petals are fused and waxy so the water can't get inside where the pollen is. And if you opened up a flower, you wouldn't see any pollen because as an added protection, the pollen is held inside little pores 
little tubes, I mean, called anthers. And how does the pollen get out of those anthers? Only with the help of specialized insects. And what pollinators are abroad in deep winter? The answer is bumblebees, specifically queen bumblebees. Unlike most insects, bumblebees have evolved the ability to keep themselves warm enough to fly in cold weather. That they are called heterotherms as opposed to ectotherms or endotherms because they have, they're sort of in the middle as far as being able to regulate their temperature. So queen bumblebees hibernate underground all winter and time their emergence with the blooming of manzanita. Here is a yellow-faced bumblebee clinging upside down to several manzanita flowers. And what she wants to do is get some pollen. So guess what she does first? She disconnects her flight muscles from her wings. And I'm not sure exactly what the mechanism is, but I think it's probably a relaxing of tendons or something like that. She then begins to vibrate her flight muscles. And as she's vibrating her fight flight muscles, if we're in the, in the area, we can start to hear a hum, a low hum. And, and the, her, her flight muscles start moving faster and faster and the vibration gets higher and higher and the pollen grains start dancing around inside the anthers. And when she gets, when the uh, pitch gets up to middle C, mm, why don't you all hum that with me? Mm, at that point, the pollen all bursts out onto her abdomen. And the pollen carries a negative charge and her body uh, develops a positive charge when she is flying. So the pollen just like gloms right onto her and the hairs, her hairs are all forked on the end. So they hold the, the pollen. So after the pollen comes out, she grooms it into structures on her back legs. And it's really fun to look at these when they're collecting pollen with close focus binoculars because you can see these pollen containing structures really easily. And then she flies to another flower and remember her abdomen's all covered with pollen. And if that flower is mature enough, it will have a stigma that's protruding beyond the lower edge of the corolla. And if the pollen contacts that stigma, um, pollination will start to happen. So 9% of the plants in the world rely on this kind of pollination, which is called buzz pollination or sonication. And what does the bumblebee get out of it? Well, she eats pollen for one thing. It helps keep her going. After she comes out of hibernation, she has to pretty quickly start a nest. And so she fortifies herself with pollen, with pollen and then she also puts the pollen in the cells where she lays her eggs so that after the eggs hatch, the larvae can eat the pollen. So here is a poem to help you remember this and please recite it with me. Bell-like blossoms downward hang, waxy coats shed winter's rain, protected pollen can't burst free till bumbles buzz in middle C. So besides bumblebees, what other insects might be interested in manzanita flowers? Uh, well, because the nectar is produced right here in the nectary at the base of the flower, and because the opening down here is really, really tiny, not many bees can get in there. And some, some bees, uh, Lassio glossum genus, there are some, and some flies can get in there. And ants can get in there, but I'm not sure they like to. But look at 
uh, sorry, it's not advancing again. Come on, there. But take a good look at these flowers. Do you see anything suspicious? What is this and this and this? These are holes cut by bees, including honeybees. And these bees who cut these holes are collectively known as nectar thieves. These deadbeats, these freeloaders actually help themselves to nectar without paying for it with pollination services. Can you imagine? And so, so manzanitas pollinators are mainly bumblebees and other bees steal nectar. What about moths and butterflies? Do they get in on the act? But butterflies, not as much. Manzanita is a really important nectar source for moths, which was new to me, news to me. At least 50 moths probably nectar on common manzanita alone. Here is a moth that spe specializes only on manzanita. It, it's a day flying moth and I've never noticed it. Maybe I've seen it, but I've never noticed it. So I'd love to hear if any of you see it nectaring on manzanita this winter. One way to remember it is by these three dots and its name, it's little kala sex signata and sex signata means the six signs or six marks. But you won't always see all six dots, as you can see here. Here there are only two visible and here there are only four visible. And so there are lots more moths that are nectar eaters. And as for butterflies, well, here where I live in Northern California, not many butterflies nectar on manzanita, partly because not many are flying in winter when manzanita is blooming because it's colder up here than it is even down in the Bay Area. And also according to butterfly expert Art Shapiro, uh, their anatomy may not uh, make it very easy for them to get nectar and I'm assuming he means their proboscis might not be designed for getting into that little tiny opening. But they are seen nectaring on a lot of manzanita flowers in coastal areas and in Southern California. I don't even really know how much in the Bay Area. So maybe they are sipping nectar that has leaked down the inside of the flower petals and is coming out the opening at the bottom. I know that happens or maybe they're getting into nectar, those nectar thief holes. So here are a few photos of butterflies on manzanita. This is a morning cloak, and this is a California tortoise shell. I've seen this one nectaring on manzanita up here a few times. The morning cloak is our earliest butterfly to appear in January. So it would be a great candidate for nectaring on on um, manzanita, but I just haven't seen that. It, by the way, uh, overwinters, both of those butterflies overwinter as adults, California tortoiseshell and morning cloak. And um, the morning cloak is the first one to appear every winter, usually in January, like January um, 18th or so they uh, secrete an antifreeze-like substance in order to be able to overwinter as adults. Uh, more butterflies, uh, this is a monarch, uh, photo taken at, oh, um, in Southern California. And this is a red admiral taken at Las Palitas Nursery in Southern California. Here's a gray hair streak and a brown elfin. And there are a few more species and I don't know if you all know about the website calscape.org, but it's just incredible. It shows, it'll tell you how many butterflies and moths are thought to, well, no, um, that's more about host plants and caterpillars, but so that's another subject. We'll get to that later. Okay, so what other insects might depend on manzanita? 
first ants. This winter, as Manzanita is blooming, look for ants traveling in columns up trunks and branches, looking for nectar. And check the size of this hole. I think, you know, that it may be that ants make holes that are big enough for uh, butterflies to then get their proboscises into. So some of the ants are ground nesting ants like the carpenter ants that make these mounds after the first rains begin. And some are species that nest in Manzanita's dead wood. Ants rely on manzanita for, also rely on manzanita for the energy rich honeydew secreted by aphids. Here is the honeydew coming out. A number of aphid species suck sap from manzanita's leaves, but one species feeds on nothing but manzanita. And that is the aphid that causes manzanita plants to make these red pouches on the edges of their leaves. These pouches are called galls and they are produced by the plant after it receives chemical orders from the manzanita leaf gall aphid. So these pouches become nurseries in which the aphids reproduce. This is a cross section. And this is another place where close focusing binoculars help. Here they are magnified a little. You can learn more about the fascinating phenomenon of galls in my oak gall chapter in my book. It's a pretty fun read. So here we have ants. Whoops, what's the problem here? I think I skipped one. Uh, here we have ants that have traveled up uh, the trunk and branches of a manzanita to drink honeydew, aphid honeydew. And on a diet of honeydew, an ant can live 14 times longer than it would without it. So think of that, if it were us, some of us could live to be 1400 years old, but in an ant, it means that it can live to be 14 days old. Some ants only live one day, but uh, unless they have honeydew to feed on and then they can live as long as two weeks. In return for the honeydew, the ants protect the aphids from predators. And so this is a mutually beneficial symbiosis. And a friend of mine, a photographer named John Klein once watched ants fighting off a yellow jacket. They, they would rear up on their hind legs and reach out with their front legs and champ their jaws. And they managed to bring, he watched them actually bring a yellow jacket down. So now I want you to guess how many descendants you think a single aphid could have in one season under optimal conditions without predators, parasites, or diseases. Think about it and write down a number. And then I'll tell you the answer a little while later. And have you ever seen the white waxy stuff this white waxy stuff on manzanita. It's produced by scale insects who hide and uh, I think they reproduce underneath it and grow underneath it. So this is a lousy photo, but if you look closely, you can see some ants here. And they are there to milk the honeydew produced by the scale insects. And in case you haven't heard enough about ants yet, you're in luck. Who do you think, sorry, right. can you see that? Okay, who do you think made these holes? Not ants, but these holes wouldn't be here if it weren't for ants and another insect, wood boring beetles. So beetles make these holes in Manzanita. I know they're pretty small and in the dead wood 
and inside they create galleries of tunnels in which they lay their eggs and the larvae develop in there. But after the beetles have moved on, wood nesting ants move in and also use them as safe places to reproduce. And in California, wood nesting ants prefer the dead wood of living manzanitas to the dead wood of all other kinds of trees or shrubs. And in most of those, the dead wood is completely dead. Phil Ward, a UC Davis entomologist, believes that ants prefer manzanita dead wood because of the moisture in the adjoining living wood, which might keep the ant larvae from drying out during California's fierce summer droughts. And while, so you, while you may not be particularly fond of ants, they are extremely important members of ecosystems. They are essential scavengers, predators, aerators of soil, harvesters and distributors of seeds, and of course, prey for practically everybody. So back to the question of who made these holes. And these holes, the answer is pileated woodpeckers who work very, very hard for their meals of ants. So before we leave ants and aphids, I'm gonna give you the answer to the question I asked earlier. How many descendants can a single aphid have in a single season under optimal condition? And the answer is, drum roll, 600 billion. So it's no wonder that Jim Zeroyan, a professor at Mendocino College, told me years ago that he thinks aphids are the primary foundation of animal food webs. And if you had an ick feeling about ants and aphids before this talk, I hope you are now filled with warm, fuzzy feelings for them. And if you aren't already, I hope you will soon also be filled with love and affection for caterpillars. At least 54 species of caterpillars are thought to feed on common manzanita alone, Octostaphylos manzanita, that's one species of manzanita. And the total number of species that feed on the Octostaphylos genus is probably significantly higher. So this is a Ceanothus silk moth caterpillar and it's the last instar or molt. So these caterpillars feed on various plants including manzanita, madrone, Ceanothus, which is what they're named after, coffee berry and others. They're actually uh, generalists of a sort. And after this caterpillar metamorphoses into a chrysalis, Come on. It will uh, dissolve into a liquid inside this pupal case and will then reform into an adult Ceanothus silk moth, which has a five inch wingspan. So you may already know this about um, the the instars, how caterpillars molt four or five times and then pupate and then become butterflies. But I'm mention it, be, mentioning it because I am finding that a lot of people, a lot of adults think that caterpillars become adult butterflies by growing wings and that the caterpillar is becomes the abdomen of the butterfly. And I can see why. If you didn't learn anything about it, it's kind of a natural thing to assume. So this is the Mendocino silk moth who lays her eggs only on manzanita and madrone. And this moth has a three inch wingspan. As you may know, caterpillars are the primary food of baby songbirds. You probably know that from Doug Tallamy, if you've heard him. 
So what this means is that if we want to have bird song every spring, we have to plant the plants that these insects can eat in our gardens. And those are mainly native plants. And we must turn our cities into caterpillar paradises by gardening for moths and butterflies. There are way more moths than butterflies, so we really have to think of ourselves as gardening for moths. And we have to learn to rejoice in leaf damage. Oh, it's not dancing. There. Rejoice in leaf damage. So try saying this with me. It's on the screen now. Woohoo! Leaf damage. That means this plant has caterpillars. So I'm going to leave insects and move on to vertebrate species now. And the first is hummingbirds. This is one of the illustrations in my book. This is a watercolor by Anne McGlinty. Manzanita nectar is an extremely important winter food for Anna's hummingbirds, which live here year round. And it's also very important for migratory hummingbirds who supposedly time their migrations to the blooming of manzanita. So now let's go back to these questions. How is manzanita pollinated? What insects feed on it? And how are its seeds dispersed? And in a roundabout way, uh, and imperfectly, I've uh, talked about these two. There are more insects that we could talk about, but um, I'm going to go on now to how are its seeds dispersed? And the answer is mostly in poop. So let's start with birds. Come on there. This is a beautiful nomadic native bird called a band-tailed pigeon who flies around in flocks following ripening fruit. And these birds are the closest relative, extant relative of the extinct passenger pigeon. And they begin eating manzanita berries in spring. Come on. When they're green. And I thought that was interesting. And for your information, in fall, they, those, those birds eat mainly acorns. In my book, I list 23 other bird species that eat manzanita berries, and there are probably more. And they include American robins, Western bluebirds, both members of the thrush family, white crowned sparrows, California thrashers, and Calif both California and mountain quail. This is a mountain quail. So birds are definitely dispersers of manzanita seeds. And everyone who spends much time in wild places knows that black bears are also, come on, also love manzanita berries. And in fact, the genus name of manzanita, Arctostaphylos, means bear grape, which is often translated as bear berry. And if you haven't seen a bear in a manzanita patch, you have probably seen evidence of bear affinity for manzanita berries. Here's another. So lots of other mammals eat manzanita berries, including various small rodents, such as mice and chipmunks, and larger ones, such as western gray squirrel and California ground squirrel. And notice these really soft cheek pouches. They're full of manzanita berries. And then there are raccoons and foxes. And by the way, Kim Cabrera is a, a great tracker and a great educator about uh, animal sign. And she, she's easily findable on the website, on her website, kimcabrera.com, I think. And coyotes. Now this coyote is in a, uh, it's either a huckleberry or a blueberry patch, a blueberry patch. Um, and blueberries are, are closely related to, um, well, they're in the same family as manzanita. Black-tailed deer also eat manzanita berries. 
So there's a longer list in my book of everybody who eats them. And all the species I've just mentioned disperse seeds in their poop, but bears and coyotes who carry a lot of seeds long distances are probably the most important dispersers. And I'm not clear on, I think there are some manzanita species whose seeds uh, are viable after going through a digestive tract, it, the, the scarification that occurs in a digestive tract is sufficient to make, make them able to germinate as opposed to the others that need to be scarified by fire. And now for a few uh, additional questions, who eats manzanita berries and who nests in or under it? And Besides aphids and caterpillars, the leaves, so here's some caterpillar damage on these leaves. The leaves are eaten, eaten by deer and probably elk, I'm sure elk, and uh, wood rats who prefer young leaves. Actually, I think everybody prefers young leaves because they aren't as high in toxins. And who nests in manzanita? At least 18 bird species. These are bush tits and can you see that there are four of them here there's one right here you can see its beak pointing down they love to do this they huddle together and i've seen groups of about 10 of them all huddled together these tiny birds build what is considered one of the 10 most extraordinary nests in the world oh. Oh. hold on I don't know what happened there. Um, it's a sock shaped nest. I'll just go on to this slide. Uh, so it's about the size and shape of a sock. And here we have a bush tit. Uh, this is a male bush tit. You can tell by his eye that doesn't have an eye ring bringing in nest material. And here we have a female removing a fecal sac. And fecal sacs are little membranous bags that the babies poop in. It's a very convenient uh, form of pampers, keeping the nest clean. And it takes a mated pair of bush tits two to six weeks to build their nests, starting with spider webs. Lots and lots of bird species begin their nests with spider webs because they're elastic and sticky. And I recommend reading the reading in my book about what happens after a bush tit nest gets destroyed by a predator. What happens, the, the social consequences of that for the pair, the mated pair and the flock. Some other kinds of nests, however, um, aren't very vulnerable to getting destroyed by predators. And here's one of them. Uh, this isn't a bird nest, although I could imagine that it might be in some other continent. <laughs> this is a wood rat mansion built in the crotch of an old growth manzanita near Lake Mendocino. I've been watching it for years and it's still in use. I don't know if you know that there are some wood rat nests that are still in use after 3,000 years in desert areas. I I shouldn't get started though. I am in love with wood rats, but, oh, uh, there we go, come on. But um, I'm afraid you'll have to read about them in my book to find out why, because I think it's probably time for me to end. Don't go yet, because I'm going to end with a poem for the touch starved after some closing remarks. So uh, thank you. Whoops, this is tricky. Thanks a lot for coming. And here's my website address, katemarianchild.com, where you can learn more about protecting and restoring insect populations, or you can buy a signed copy of my book or my laminated oak identification guides. 
or if you can read about and learn why you might want to buy the amazing lightweight and life-changing close focusing binoculars that will enable you to see things like longhorn fairy moths close up on buttercups without even bending your knees. And I urge you to join or support the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society or your local chapter. I know there are some people here tonight from Texas and Portland and Los Angeles. So not everybody is from the Bay Area and there are people from Ukiah. So um, CNPS is doing the critical work of protecting and restoring native plants and the future of our world depends on them. So don't forget to garden for moths, rejoice in leaf damage and help turn your city or town into a caterpillar paradise. And here is a poem for everyone who is alone and or touch starved these days. And again, please read it with me. Manzanita, most sinuous of shrubs, your silky soft skin invites gentle rubs. For all lacking hugs in these covidly times, caressing your limbs is a pleasure sublime. Kind of corny, but it's what I got. Okay, so now we will take, I will take questions. And thank you, Kate. That was. That was lovely, and uh, we really appreciate you coming. And so many. I'm sorry we couldn't turn off the turn on the sound for everybody, but we have so many people that it would have been <laughs> a lot. So um, I'm not sure. What do you mean, turn on the sound? For uh, allow people to join in in singing. Uh, oh, kind of oh like, no, no, that wouldn't have worked at all. I knew <laughs> people had to be singing at home. We had to have everybody muted because there's a delay factor, and it's just. Awful. Very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a number of questions, of course, as expected. So uh, we have questions about growing manzanitas, and um, and is this the best time now they're blooming? But is this also a good time to take cuttings? Oh, I don't know anything about cultivating manzanitas. But before you um, are, I want to see people. Oh, there we go. I want to see people. Uh, the people who are asking the questions. And I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Okay, it'll be just be me asking the questions actually. I mean, not asking, oh, so I can't, oh yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah. so I can't see people anyway. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> we've got people asking questions from YouTube also. So we've been, we've had a couple hundred people over there. So um, so one question is, I, you may have covered this, but what causes the red color in manzanitas? Oh, it's the tannins in them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think they're phenolic compounds and that um, I, I was saying that they are, they, they turn the bark red and they um, make the bark very bitter. Very bitter. Although yeah. people did mention in the chat that their goats love the manzanita, to chew on the manzanita. So that on, is, the, on the leaves? Oh, on, okay. on the branches, I guess. I'm not, I'm not certain. They didn't specify, but. So I just um, want to say that uh, the tannins in, uh, redwood bark also has tannins. That's why it's as red as it is. And when, where I live, uh, when it, when we have a lot of runoff in the winter from rain, uh, the streams and ponds uh, turn brown and that's from the tannins in the oak leaves. Mm. Yes. Um, so we had some questions about how you tell the difference when you're out in the field between a madrone, madrone and manzanitas. And I suggested leaves. Are there other tips that you have for before you get familiar with the different species? Oh, well, um, uh, leaves are a good one. Uh, madrone, leave, madrone leaves are a lot bigger than manzanita leaves. They are you know, more like an in, uh, two inches minimum in length and manzanita leaves are more like, oh, probably not much more than an inch and a quarter or inch and a half. And um, madrone leaves are slightly serrated on the edges, aren't they? 
And uh, then madrone trunks are usually wider and bigger and the, um, the color of the bark is more kind of a warmer pink than the deeper burgundy of manzanitas. And yeah, I agree. More of, a, more of an orangey kind of tree, big tree. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, and you can spot them from um, their great spiraling. So we had questions about spiraling clockwise or counterclockwise. And also someone had mentioned, do they twist the same way everywhere, which I guess is a similar question. Someone mentioned that their uh, manzanita had spiraled 720 degrees within six feet. Do you want to say anything about spiraling? I don't know anything about spiraling. I don't know what causes it, what the survival benefits of it are. Um, by the way, I want to go back to madrones, which is uh, that their fruits are also much bigger than manzanita fruits. They're kind of like a little smaller than grapes. And manzanitas are more like huckleberries or blueberries. Right. And socks. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, we had someone coming in from the Pacific Northwest who mentioned that they're having uh, losing a number of madrones to Phythophthora. Um, and they're wondering, based on desperation and a little bit of research about applying hydrogen peroxide to the roots. And if you had any thoughts about that, I haven't heard that before. No, I know nothing about that. Um, I know one person, uh, there's a, a website called Sudden Oak life and that uh, the host of that site and I, uh, he's a scientist and he believes that the key is to strengthen the bark of trees and to use various treatments for that that you can read about on his site but it's it's very experimental i i would talk to the um you know a lot of research has been done with in in the area of Phytophthora, so uh, in, in the universities. Yes, in Berkeley and so forth. Yeah. Uh, we had some questions about uh, growing manzanitas in um, San Francisco with serpentine, I guess Mount Davidson and serpentine, um, whether they ne might need mycorrhizae. I'm, I know you mentioned you were not a, a gardener necessarily with madrones or know much about cultivation, but do you have any thoughts about uh, manzanitas on serpentine substrates, nickel? I don't. I have grown, I, I, I transplanted a madrone here and where I live and it's doing beautifully, but it's not serpentine here. And I haven't paid attention to whether madrone grows in serpentine. Um, you know, there, is there anyone else? I guess it would be nice if we could, I'm sure there are some experts here that we could yeah, I think someone yeah. might uh, might uh, put it in the chat. It. We'll wait for that answer to come in. Um, so let me see. Uh, and there's a question about whether um, that uh, warrior's plume or Indian warrior is hemiparasitic on the drone. Um, does it also is it also hemiparasitic on manzanitas? Do you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. It's always nice to see those in a month or two. Um, I know. Oh, I, yeah, I think they'll be coming pretty soon. Yeah. And, and so I mean, maybe maybe we should explain for people who don't know what hemiparasitic means. It's these uh, this uh, plant called um, warrior's plume. Formerly, a lot of people know it as Indian Indian warrior. Um, <clears throat> has green leaves, but it doesn't do all. It, it also is parasitic on the roots of various plants that it lives near. So it photosynthesizes some of its own sugars, but it takes the others from other plants via their roots. And it's uh, related to Indian paintbrush. Yes. Thank, thank you for that. Um, I just had one person put, I just want to say when you saw, showed the photo of the um, the flowers with the little holes in them. Somebody had mentioned bee loaders, which I think is a great. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's like cute, that. thank you. <laughs> you can use that, I bet they'll let you use it in the future. Um, so uh, 
again to cultivation, but someone asked whether bonsai was impossible. And I thought I had remembered seeing bonsai manzanita, but uh, yeah. Any, anybody else? We'll no, have to have I, yeah. bonsai experts out there. I know there are some with native plants, so. Yeah, put it in the chat or, I wish we could unmute some people now, but I guess yeah. that's. <laughs> well, we'll see, we'll see what comes up. Um, a lot of questions about edibility. Um, for people and how large the seeds are and different uses like that. Um, yeah, so- Any special preparation needed for those? So the, uh, the, what I like to do, when I was backpacking once and a bear got my food and it was, a, it was when manzanita berries were ripe. And so I hung out for a couple of days living on manzanita berries. And what I do is I just take a big handful of them and crush them, put them in my mouth, crush them in my teeth, and then suck the juice out and then spit out the remaining pulp and uh, seeds. The seeds are, uh, if you got too many seeds, you could get intestinal blockage from them. But uh, the manzanita berries were, there were and are very popular with native Californians as a source of um, cider, making manzanita cider. And the berries uh, are also dried and put into, I don't know, kind of like bread or pemmican type concoctions. Yeah, we um, do have some, some folks uh, mentioning that it is a current practice amongst people, um, indigenous people. So just yeah. Not a past practice alone, but right. current yeah. practice. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that I have seen different um, preparations out there for manzanita. Yeah, the, the thing is mainly not to eat too many seeds, although I did read that some uh, berries are the pulp isn't is pretty sparse that there there's more seed the ratio of seed to pulp is uh, high. And in those where, where the berry, in places where the berries were like that, uh, people ate the seeds. And I don't know if anybody is currently eating seeds as opposed to the pulp. The fruit. But they're not tapped for syrup. I think someone must be from the East Coast. <laughs> I don't think a, no, like no. from April. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So about serpentine, um, a few people have been weighing in saying that like big berry manzanita, the Arctostaphylos glauca, um, down here in our area, in Los Gatos, Edgewood Park, uh, Mount Tam, different places people have seen uh, manzanitas on serpentine. Um, so that's okay. good. That's good, thank you. We got a lot going on here. So the, um, the flowers condense moisture from fog-like trees. Let me see this question here. Um, I did get one one person sharing an experience where they were, uh, another docent they were with um, told the story on a warm day, she was patting a manzanita for quite a while. She then discovered that her hand was covered in ants and the ants were protecting their tree from the invader. So nice, a nice memory there, <clears throat> a nice story. So um, the question was, do flowers condense moisture from fog like trees and shrubs of the region? Like do. I guess redwoods do, I don't know. Say that again. Do, do flowers it. condense moisture from fog-like trees and shrubs, fog-like trees and shrubs of the region? Oh, I, 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 I don't, well, the, the flowers are blooming in the winter. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know, I, I, I doubt it. I don't think it's significant. Yeah. <laughs> Like they do the best they can to get as much fog. Um, so uh, there was a question about how the moth gets the nectar out and someone I think answered that as just having a long proboscis. Is that how they do it? I don't know, but I, I wanted to look that up myself because this whole thing about moths and manzanitas is new for me. I just learned that in the course of preparing this talk. That's great. Didn't have time to research that, but I wanted to. Uh, there was a question, oh, could you clarify the name of the aphid that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, the manzanita leaf gall aphid. Okay. And um, then, yes, mm -hmm. yes, someone just answered that in the thing. So uh, let's see, let's 
let's see. Um, and then there was a question about the uh, diversification of of um, of manzanitas that you know, we have a lot of rare species around here. And then also the Uva Ursi extends around the Northern Arboreal latitudes, um, North America, Europe, and Russia. Is that the progenitor? The progenitor is right here in Central California. That's where Manzanita first uh, emerged. Okay. Is that what the question is? Was it was it was the progenitor in the circumpolar area? Yeah, yeah. Whether that common species, the bearberry, the bearberry. Ufer, is that the one? Is that the progenitor? Since that's the one species that goes throughout the temperate areas, the northern arboreal areas, you know. But you're saying it's not necessarily that species. Well, they all came from here. So mm. the bearberries that are all around the world are originated here. Great. Right. But I don't know if they are somehow more, I don't know if they're a progenitor, mm -hmm. proge the progenitor of everything else. Right. Let's see. Um, I think we were getting a lot of it here. A lot of people want to want to try cider cookies and everything else from the manzanita, mm. <laughs> manzanita berries. Uh, we got people from Portland, Maine, as well as um, as well as uh, the Pacific Northwest. And we had a lot of positive comments about that. Um, let's see. Does anybody, uh, either of my co-hosts have any additional questions that's, that are coming up that I've missed so far? Um, what I can see is that you've gotten them um, all, Judy, on this side. I have one here. Is it okay to rub the peeling bark off to show rub the peeling bark off to show the beautiful bark underneath? Oops. I think it's probably okay. I don't it's gonna come off sooner or later. And it would probably just allow more light to get in and more photosynthesis to happen. Uh -huh. I, I think it's nice to leave them in their natural state because I think the peeling bark is quite beautiful too. And I probably wouldn't want to walk around and find every, that every tree had had its bark rubbed off, but occasionally I think it would be fine. Maybe too tempting for someone to carve their initials in anyway. <laughs> right, yeah. So can you okay. dye with manzanita? Can you do uh, dyeing like wool? I don't know. I had never heard of that. We're getting a lot of creative questions here. It's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, we, we want to ask another person to ask uh, the name of the mushroom fungus and how do you spell it, I guess. Well, we can. Oh, it's Manza, the one I, I showed, Manzanita Bolete, B O L E T E. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, this question okay. I don't quite understand, but I will ask it. So, with all these creatures living in and on these trees are all the relationships with the manzanita com commensal. So does, it, um, does that make sense to you? Because I'm not sure. I quite commensal, know. I think, is the opposite of parasitic. It's okay. Thank you, Madeline. I thought commensal just meant that they share the same house. Mm -hmm. Okay. As, a, as opposed to um, you know, cooperative. So, right. Uh, I don't know. Um, so there. Uh, the question is basically: Are they antagonistic, or do they all get along with each other? <laughs> um, they all have their niches, their niches, and um, some of them probably prey on others. But there is a lot of cooperation in. Uh, like, you know, the, the, between the ants and the aphids, that symbiosis, and the ants and the scale and insects. Thank you. Um, apart from the bully, uh, someone said that I missed the mycorrhizal fungi associations. Did you go over any particular species? Um, well, I only showed two species, the okay. manzanita bully and the um, black trumpets. Mm -hmm. the horns of plenty, but in my book, I list 18 species that uh, oh. are known to be mycorrhizal with manzanita. Great. Okay. 
And uh, we have questions about uh, home gardening cultivars, but um, I think that's for another talk when we have talk about propagating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, them and treating them with hydrogen peroxide, which is new to me. So, <laughs> or at least the uh, madrones. Um, and, and folks are saying you can die with it. So we're getting some of that information. In. Oh, okay. Um, and then someone in Seattle said my mature uh, Arctostaphylus densifolia, densiflora sentinel blooms profusely every winter, but never produces berries. Any idea why? I have some other manzanitas in the vicinity for cross pollination. <laughs> um, I know some plants just don't produce fruit for 20, 30 years. Uh, my, my madrone, no, my manzanitas are producing berries and they're pretty young. So I don't have an answer for that. Well, my, one idea also is that Sentinel, I believe, is from of uh, its parentage is Archostaphylus pajarorensis. So in Seattle, it's pretty far north of its range. So oh. it may be lacking. It may be lacking pollinators there. Hmm. That's could be a case. Um, just in terms of we're getting down here, and I don't want to keep you too long. But if you a couple other questions, uh, we always sure. get some flying in at the end. But here's a creative one you may not have heard in a previous talk, but can you buzz pollinate it with a sonic to toothbrush? This is one you may not have expected. <laughs> no, I, I bet you can. Um, you can put a tuning fork that you hit, a, a middle C tuning fork, mm -hmm. and you can cause the pollen to burst out with that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, actually, I don't know what the frequency would be of a um, sonic toothbrush, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, sonic toothbrush. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us get back to us, uh, whoever asked that question and let us know how it works out. Another okay, idea, another idea that I was going to suggest and then I cut it out because I didn't think I had enough time. I was trying to edit my presentation was if, um, if anyone were interested, they could take a, set up a camera on a tripod and mark a manzanita leaf and then come out, go out every hour to photograph it, to see if, you, if to, to prove that it moves during the day with the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Those kind of pollinate, they're interesting, the phototropism. Um, to a more serious question about fires, we've had a lot of fires in our chapter area this year. Um, for chaparral areas where fire has gone through, what might they expect in terms of regeneration? I know there's different ways they regenerate. Do you have any thoughts about that or might they just disappear? Well, so some manzanitas are burl forming and they usually sprout after fire. The ones that are, that are the propagate by seed, um, germ, regenerate by seed. Uh, some of them can't do that without fire. So um, they've, you know, manzanita has co-evolved with fire. And I always wonder how much the native Californians have influenced that sort of selected for fire dependent species. But uh, so I think it depends on how hot the fire is and was and how uh, deeply it penetrated the soil and whether the seed bank got destroyed or, but um, fire is necessary for a lot of manzanita seeds to, mm -hmm. to germinate. So. Right. Um, and we've had some, some places where the, it just looks like it's gone. All the chaparral is just gone. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next few years, especially if we could use a little bit more rain. Yeah. Germinate things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of people are reminding me that Arctostaphylus uva ursi is mostly called in many places, knick knick and not bearberry, but okay. Common names. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Reminder. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Let's see, commensal is benefiting one and not affecting the other negatively or positively. So that's- oh, that's what commensal means? Huh. Yeah, that's what someone said in the two chat. So I'll go with that. Uh -huh. 
And why does manzanita bark, or I guess even more often to me, madrone bark feel cold? Or is it so the that's, water? That's because I think um, if you put your hand, it's so smooth that if you put your hand on it, uh, it there's no insulating factor, like rough bark, you, let's see, how does this work? Um, so your hand, it will suck up your hand's heat because there's no, there are no air spaces. And I think that's the main reason. I, when I wrote my book, I you know, looked into that and I couldn't find any other plausible reason. There, oh, there was one idea that because it photosynthesizes in its um, trunk and, and, and limbs, possibly the process of photosynthesis uses up energy that causes heat loss. But that's, that's the only other idea I have. Besides, like if you put your hand on a, on a smooth piece of metal, it's going to be colder than if you put your hand on the bark of a furrowed trunk of a tree. And it's just that because of the, uh, the way heat is exchanged. But okay. they, are called, they are called refrigerator trees. And yeah. there was a rumor that uh, native people used to climb up into madrones on cold days to cool off. But I talked with a Pomo friend of mine about it and she kind of poo-pooed that idea, so. Well, we could try it and see see how that works. So uh, it, it actually does. It, it would work. To it would work. You would feel cooler if you did mm -hmm. that. If you scrub full length without any clothes on on a big madrone limb <laughs> <laughs> on a hot day. <laughs> Depends on the park, I think these days. <laughs> <laughs> I live in a place where it's easier to do that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I'm gonna check with my co-hosts again. Am I missing something? Um, there's a lot of chat in the in the we, which we will save for you, but I'm not sure it's actually questions. Um, a lot of talk about home gardening and whether you should inject it with mycorrhizae when you plant it, which people do with oaks and so forth. Um, and uh, I think that's a that's about the extent of it. Um, Arvind or Madeline, do you have any anything else? Well, there are I actually a lot of questions. Um, I just have one on my mind. Uh, what's your favorite manzanita? Well, you know, this, this, I, is, this is someone else's question. Oh, uh-huh. Um, you know what? I hate to admit this, but I don't, I haven't uh, worked at all on learning to identify manzanitas by species. So what we have a lot of here is common manzanita, Arctostaphylos manzanita, and I'm totally in love with that. So I guess that's my answer. <laughs> I haven't, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time around a lot of the other uh, manzanita species. So Judy, I just wanna say for some people saying what was easy to grow, I put in the chat several of the cultivars, some that I've had, most of them I've had experience with that are um, pretty easy to grow. But as a general principle, I would suggest checking what's native in your area we have a tool called CalScape from the California Native Plant Society. You can put in your zip code, see what's native in your area mm -hmm. and um, selecting cultivars that are based on those species means they would probably be best for you. And it also, and you can also do some research online like at Las Palitas um, website about um, which ones have good performance in the garden because you know gardens can have challenging features like not good drainage or things like that and um john dorley is a mid-size that's pretty darn easy to grow you just have to give it a little mound because when you see manzanitas in the wild they're typically on hillsides so you want to give them some drainage you have to you have to create it in your yard if it's flat. 
the wonder, thank you, Madeline, but the wonderful part of that is then you can study them and watch them and see all these wonderful interactions that Kate has described tonight. So that's the good part about it, right? Yes. I have one that's going great guns. Oh, I hate that expression. That's doing very well uh, on flat ground. Great. Um, okay, I think that's about it. Vivian, did you wanna, thank you very much, Kate, for your patience and asking all these questions, which are, with 500 people, it's quite a bit of diversity or more than 500 people. So we There are more than 500 people? I think we had about 560 most of the time tonight. So um, wow. quite a few. So we had lots of, lots of great comments and we appreciate everybody's participation in this and thanks for coming. So uh, Vivian, do you wanna wrap up? Well, I just wanted to say, can Thank Kate again. I was really looking forward to this talk and I'm absolutely thrilled. I, it was it was fa a fabulous talk. I'm still reeling over this 600 billion aphids, but <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, the poems, the singing, oh, it's just, it was just wonderful. So thank you so much for that. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, next week, we'll be having our members uh, photo sharing evening. So if anybody has time, please do stop in and, and join us then and, and check out our website and or meet up to find out what else is going on or, or most of all, join our news list because that's where we send our weekly updates of upcoming events. So Kate, thank you so much. And uh, don't, oh, oh yeah, and don't forget, Kate's gonna be speaking again to East Bay in two weeks. Yeah, so. and but before you go, can you tell me how to save the chat? Yes. Uh, so down there at the bottom of your chat, there's a dot, dot, dot next to the, you know, where you type in. Over. Yeah. Oh, I see. Save yeah. chat. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So any, any of you who want to save some of the great information in the chat, you should feel free to do that. You can just go and save that chat. And um, then where, where, where will I find it in my computer? It should, there should be a folder that pops up, um, a Zoom folder that pops up for you. It'll, it'll be kind of obvious. It'll be a folder. You'll see it. Okay. Okay. We'll check. We'll check back with you. Make sure you get it. Okay. So YouTube folks, I'm going to end the YouTube stream right now. So we will be going away, but thank you so much for joining okay. us and uh, hope to see you again.